the International Federation of Rural Surgeons arranged a series of Zoom meetings for the benefit of the rural surgeons. This is the summary of the lecture on bladder outflow obstruction. The benign prostatic hyperplasia is the most common cause of bladder outflow obstruction. It's a very common condition. Every male will have a 50% chance of uh, having some amount of enlargement of the prostate at the age of 50. Then the prostate starts growing in size. And by the time you reach 90 years, almost 90% of the men will have enlarged prostate. And now we see more of this problem because the life expectancy of the people are slowly increasing. But one thing to remember is that the symptoms or the need for treatment is not really actually dependent on the size of the prostate. You might have a very large prostate without causing any obstruction or a small prostate which can cause significant obstruction. What are the symptoms? The symptoms due to bladder outflow obstruction are divided into two groups. One group is called the obstructive symptoms. These are namely hesitancy, which means that uh, once someone starts to pass urine, he goes to the toilet and wants to pass urine, it takes a little while for the urine to come out. This is because uh, normally the once the sphincters relax, the detrusor muscles contract and generate about uh, 60 centimeters of water or pressure to make the urine come out. With obstruction, the pressure necessary to make the urine come out keeps increasing. So this makes the time taken to start passing urine slightly longer. So this is interpreted as hesitancy by the patients. And then after some time, you find that uh, the urinary stream is slow. So what they say is it's almost like this, depending on the age group. So when you're young, you can really have a very good stream. Then as you grow older, it goes like this, then slightly low, say much lesser. And with the advancing years, the stream becomes small. Many people interpret it as a normal progression as you keep growing older. This again is because uh, even though the muscles develop enough uh, pressure to pass urine, the flow cannot be sustained like in younger days if there is obstruction. So that is the cause for poor stream. And then it leads to what we call intermittency. Here the stream goes up, down, up, down, and so that. This is because uh, the bladder muscles cannot sustain pressure for a long time. So when it relaxes a little while and then increases the pressure and so on. Imagine you're walking with a heavy suitcase uh, in a railway platform. If the suitcase is small and light, you just carry it and walk all the way. But if it's a heavy one, you'll walk for some time, keep it down and then uh, relax for a while and then uh, lift it and walk further. This is what happens with intermittency. And then uh, it leads to the condition called incomplete voiding. If they're not able to sustain the pressure for a long time, the muscles get tired. Then you feel that even though you have passed urine, some more urine is left behind in the bladder. And finally, the most uh, problematic uh, symptom is that you'll go into painful retention of urine. Especially this occurs in people when they try postponing the micturition. What happens is that when the bladder stretches beyond a certain level, it's difficult to start contracting again. So the obstructive symptoms are hesitancy, poor stream, intermittency, incomplete voiding, and acute painful retention of urine. Then we also have what is called the Irritative symptoms. So this, uh, the most common symptom or the most early symptom is nocturia. Normally, when you go to sleep, you don't have to get up to pass urine. You wake up next morning and pass urine. 
This is because of several reasons. You have antidiuretic hormone and uh, you drink less during night and so on. But then if there is a benign prostatic hyperplasia, bladder outflow obstruction, you need to keep waking up in the night to pass urine. And this is initially noticeable at night. But then later, even during daytime, the increased uh, frequency of passing urine. And then you can have a dysuria. What happens is that if there is a mild infection or inflammation, it causes a burning sensation. And then finally, you get to a stage where there is urgency. It's not possible to hold urine for a longer time. And later on, you can have symptoms of uh, blood in the urine or hematuria. And then frequent urinary tract infection, especially if there is a significant uh, post-void urine. These irritative voiding symptoms, although commonly occur due to benign prostatic hyperplasia or bladder outflow obstruction, can be due to other causes also. So what causes this uh, obstruction? 60% of the obstruction is due to the prostate glands, which increase in size. The prostate has both the glandular structure and then connective tissue and capsule around it. The remaining 40% is uh, dynamic obstruction. And uh, the lumen and uh, connective tissue contribute to half the obstruction. In other words, the increase in size of the gland contribute to only 50% of the obstruction. And uh, again, uh, in only 60% of the obstruction due to the glands actually enlarge. What I had uh, talked to you so far has been there for a long time. And recently, a lot of studies have gone into finding the pathophysiology. And as this uh, diagram shows, there are many causes, uh, many contributory factors to causing this uh, outflow obstruction. And now the recent finding is that if there is any inflammation in the pelvis, the risk of uh, retention is higher. Or in other words, if there is any element of inflammation, you need to get them operated much earlier. And again, obesity, dyslipidemia, and even diabetes are known to aid the progression of the disease. These are recent findings and the summary of that. And what are the investigations uh, we can do in a rural area? The most important uh, investigation to start with is the urine analysis. So this will give us whether there's any infection or there is a hematuria. The prostate has a lot of blood vessels in the surface. When it increases in size, there will be hematuria. And if there is a significant post-void residue, that can again cause some infection. And another useful test is to actually watch and see how they pass urine. This will uh, tell you whether they have a poor stream, whether there is hesitancy, whether there is intermittency, and so on. And again, we are interested in uh, renal functions. If the renal functions are poor or affected because of back pressure changes, then you need to operate immediately. So it's good to do the renal function test. And we are interested in knowing what the PSA is. We would like to know whether there is any may evidence of malignancy. And now recently, the C-reactive protein this gives an idea about whether there is significant inflammation. As I mentioned earlier, if there is evidence of inflammation, it is good to operate earlier because the complications are higher. And if we do have uh, facilities for uroflometry, it can do it, but it doesn't really matter. It can be replaced with just observing how they pass urine. One of the important tests that we have is called PSA, prostate-specific antigen. As the name suggests, it's prostate-specific, but unfortunately, it's not cancer-specific. So what it means is that if you have an elevated uh, PSA, it does not always mean that you have cancer. 
zero to four is uh, normal. Four to ten is taken as uh, borderline, and greater than ten, there is significant chance of uh, malignancy. So this is uh, one of the tests that we use uh, for follow-up of uh, patients with carcinoma of the prostate. The most important test that we do is called cystometrogram, CMG, or bladder pressure studies. We have had a full lecture on CMG. Please go and watch that because it's a very important investigation. That will give you a lot of information about uh, low urinary tract symptoms. And this is necessary because uh, one third of the spinal cord nerves go to the control of the bladder. And we have a lot of patients with diabetes and uh, people who are older where these nerves can be affected. So it's good to find out the cause for the lower urinary, low urinary tract symptoms before trying to treat it. A quick uh, description of how we do the CMG. We always uh, give them antibiotic prophylaxis. We clean and rape as for any major surgeries. Then we pass two infant feeding tubes, one five French and one eight French. And uh, we use the IV tubing as manometers to measure the pressures. And the level, it's important to make sure that uh, zero is set at the level of the pubic symphysis. There are some things which is uh, important to remember. The patient needs to empty the bladder before you start uh, doing the CMG. And uh, although it is not the ideal situation, we use one of the IV tubings to fill the bladder so that you can quickly finish the test. And the other one is used as the manometer. So when you're using as a manometer, you have to make sure that it acts as a manometer. So you need to make the patient cough and uh, see if the level is going up and down with the increase in pressure. Sometimes because the jelly is thick and the tubing is blocked, this might not happen and uh, you might have a misinterpretation. The first, uh, you need to measure the resting pressure. So this is as soon as you start, uh, before you start filling. Or fill a little bit and then start the resting pressure. This is usually about 10 to 12 centimeters. And the bladder muscles are arranged in such a way that when the volume increases, there is no rapid increase in pressure, like a balloon. In a balloon, if the, with the increase in volume, the pressure increases. On the other hand, in uh, the bladder, for a majority of the time in normal person, there's no significant increase in the pressure which are recorded uh, in the bladder. Then you need to record the sensation. The sensation when there is a little bit of uh, urine in the bladder, then uh, the normal desire to pass urine, the urgency, or there any unusual sensation or there any lack of sensations. And then you like to measure the maximum voiding pressure. And after the procedure, post void residue. So in a normal study, the normal resting pressure is about 10 to 12 centimeters of water. And this stays within that range for about 350 to 400 ml, which is the normal capacity of the bladder. And then uh, first sensation up here, when the volume is about 150 ml, and the normal voiding sensation, when the capacity reaches about 350 ml. And then there is a slight increase in pressure, and this is translated as urgency or desire to pass urine uh, fairly quickly. And then the maximum voiding pressure in men is about 60 centimeters of water and about 40 centimeters in women. And the post void residue should be less than 30 centimeters of water. What is the finding in bladder outflow obstruction? The benign uh, prostatic hypertrophy is the most uh, common cause of increase in maximum voiding pressure. The normal is 60. And uh, if it is above 90, then there is significant obstruction. 
then we would recommend a surgical treatment because uh, the patient can go into acute painful retention anytime. But when the pressure is between 60 to 90, it's possible to try medical treatment. Again, the post-void residue of more than 30 ml is significant. Earlier, we said that uh, the two investigations which any rural doctor needs to learn, one is the system metrogram of bladder pressure studies. And the next is the cystoscopy diagnosis or have a look inside the bladder. And uh, we also said that we have a laptop cystoscope which we have devised, which is a very low cost uh, method of having a look inside the bladder. So what are the things that we look for? Starting in the meatus, there may be narrowing or at the meatus, which is fairly common. And this can uh, present as bladder outflow obstruction. And here the treatment is very simple, just dilate the meatus. Then there could be strictures on the way. And uh, there may be stones in the bladder or there may be tumors in the bladder. And you'll also like to see how big the prostate is, whether it's a bilobar obstruction, as we see here, or is it uh, primarily a median lobe obstruction? and whether the size is uniformly enlarged in both sides and so on. And then whether there is a hypertrophy of the bladder muscles or detrusor muscles, as we can see here. What are the treatment options available for BPH? The most uh, common recommendation is watchful waiting, especially if you're done a system metrogram and the pressure is uh, between 60 to 90. If it is towards uh, the 70 side or towards the 60 side, then you don't really have to do anything because uh, the obstruction increases as the patient uh, grows older. Then we have the medical treatment. We have two groups of medicines, both of which can be used. And then if it is above 90, we have the surgical uh, treatment. The gold standard right now is the transurethral resection of prostate. And if it's a very small prostate, you can have just an incision of the prostate. And then what we do is the transurethral vaporization of the prostate. And of course, some places still continue to do open prostate surgeries. And there are a number of other minimally invasive procedures which are available as treatment. What are the risk factors for progression or which would uh, recover fairly quick treatment, surgical treatment? One is the advanced stage. People over 62 years, it's better to offer surgical treatment uh, instead of uh, watchful waiting. Or if the prostate size is large, which can again translate into a PSA being elevated. One, it can be a small uh, tumor sitting somewhere or just the increase or uh, large size of the prostate can uh, elevate the PSA. And if the symptoms are significant, again, uh, if the patient is affected by the symptom, for a villager who is no, not from other work, who is taking care of the family, he may not be bothered about the symptoms. But if the when the symptoms bother the work or affect the work of the patient, then they need to offer. And again, if there is a significant uh, post void residue, it will lead to reduced functional capacity of the bladder and also more chance of infection and uh, renal problems. So then they need to operate. As we said, there are two groups of uh, medicine that are used for medical treatment. One is the alpha blockers. The first generation included medicines like prazosin, doxazosin, terazosin. And uh, these were then uh, changed to the second generation because they caused a significant uh, orthostatic hypotension. In other words, if they suddenly 
get up from a sitting position or lying down it cause uh, means transient hypotension and giddiness so then the uroselective alpha blockers came in like tamsulosin alfazosin and tamsulosin is the most uh, popular medicine which is used in this group then we have uh, the group called pi alpha reductase inhibitors this prevent the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone which is necessary for growth of the prostate and uh, there are two types of receptors and uh, finasteride uh, inhibits type 1 receptors while deuteresteride inhibits both type 1 and type 2 but clinically there are not much of a difference between these two so then the cheaper finasteride could still be used or as most commonly many people do we can use deuteresteride and recently they have found even metformin has a anti proliferative effect so in other words uh, finasteride or deuteresteride can be combined with the metformin and uh, many of the patients will already have diabetes so it's an added advantage or combining these medicines it's also possible to combine in the, the tamsulosin deuteresteride or finasteride and metformin all three can be used uh, because they increase the performance of the other so this is the co- combination therapy so you can use the alpha 1 uh, blockers or alpha reductase inhibitors or the miscellaneous drugs and the graph here indicates how much benefit is there here the maximum benefit and this is the maximum benefit this group so we can sort of titrate and even otherwise give the combination if necessary and what are the contraindications to medical treatment of course uh, if there is acute painful retention of urine even after a trial void it's then better to operate because uh, medicine might not have too much an effect or if the bladder is very large and very significant post void residue is there or if it is already affected the kidneys and uh, there is renal insufficiency or if there is a uh, severe retractable urinary tract infection or if there is a uh, recurrent hematuria and finally if there is a large diverticular stone which again need treatment so these are the contraindications for medical treatment but immediate uh, surgical treatment is preferred now for many years in recent times transurethral resection of prostate has been the gold standard for treatment and uh, although it started with almost 3% the mortality and morbidity has significantly reduced over time and it's about 0.2% now and even now bleeding and clot retention uh, common and hence uh, we don't uh, teach it to everyone only the specialists uh, need it for treating and again once it is uh, bleeding there are special techniques to control this bleed so we need a fair amount of training and also backup where blood is available if there is significant bleeding and sometimes uh, we can also have what is called the tur syndrome if the water or uh, glycine which is used for irrigation gets absorbed into the vascular system this can cause uh, increase pulse rate or sometimes even bradycardia and uh, causes neurological problems although this is a transient uh, this is due to hyponatremia and needs immediate treatment and sometimes the uh, glycine is also known to cause transient blindness and uh, retrograde ejaculation and incontinence a uh, rare surgical complication which is associated with qrp earlier we used to do only open prostate surgery here the problem is it's a uh, fairly blind procedure because the location of the prostate and uh, this is now carried out only in special circumstances when uh, you cannot put the patient in a lithotomy position and 
he need to I mean, do it in superimposition. Or if there is a large diverticular or very large calculus, which needs treatment. So we combine the prostate surgery along with it. And now the advantage is that uh, even there is significant bleeding. Earlier, we relied only on uh, packing. Now we can actually do a, I mean, through the scope, we can uh, visualize the bleeders and we can treat it. But sometimes uh, we still, uh, there is a severe stricture and it's not possible to pass the receptoscope. You might uh, require uh, open surgery. Otherwise, selective open surgery is not preferred because there can be significant mortality, which is not acceptable at this time. There are many minimally invasive prostate uh, surgeries like transurethral needle ablation, transurethral microthermotherapy, prostatic stents, and uh, laser vaporization. These are all experimental and uh, probably not the uh, easily available to everyone. And uh, each one has these advantages and disadvantages. And the commonest disadvantage is that they are all very expensive. So what we do is what is called uh, transurethral vaporization of the prostate. This is a very safe, effective, and economic alternative. And uh, the only drawback here is that you may not have significant uh, tissues for biopsy or histopathological examination. So we combine it with resecting a few pieces for examine, histopathology examination. Here we have modified the regular electrocautery machine to have a much higher wattage. Normally we use about 100 to 150 wattage for resecting. Here we use about 400 watts for vaporizing through a specially designed electrodes, which are called vapor probes. This I mean, concentrates the heat on the tip and literally vaporizes the prostate tissue and forming a eschar around it, which will uh, prevent absorption of the irrigating fluids. So it is very safe and can be easily learned. And uh, although it is a little slower than uh, QRP, it is a much, much safer alternative. Thank you.